Hello, everyone. It's me, Andrew. I am tuning in or broadcasting, rather, from Star Cottage Studio here in lovely Ligonier, Pennsylvania. Uh, it is actually super lovely here today. It's super sunny, slightly breezy, not too hot, not too cold. Um, it's really beautiful here. Um, and I am itching to be outside. However, I have so much work to do that uh, that's a little bit tricky right now, um, which is unfortunate, but you know, it is what it is. So one of the things that I've been working on today is uh, getting ready for a presentation that I'm doing at this inaugural Snag at Touchstone event that is happening this weekend. So we leave uh, for the event on Friday. Uh, so we're super busy. We're going to be gone all weekend. Um, we've lined up the house sitter and luckily we're not too far. So if we need to run back, we can still run back. Um, you know, that's less than ideal when you're trying to like, you know, do stuff. But, um, yeah, so we, I've been getting ready for that. It's been a little bit of, uh, emotional. Um, it's been a little emotional going through things. Um, uh, one of the things that I'm doing right now is I'm listening to an audio book while I'm working. Um, and if you didn't know, it is Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month, the month of May. You may not know that because I haven't really seen that much talk about it. Um, but you know, it's kind of like Black History Month or uh, Women's Month. Uh, but uh, this month, May, is Asian American uh, Pacific Islander Day. And a part of that is my local library has, and I guess a lot of the libraries actually have um, been trying to promote Asian American voices through their offerings. So one of the things they did is uh, there's a book called uh, Taste Like War, and um, there's no restrictions on it, um, and, which means that usually what they do is they buy, I guess, the rights to distribute the books, um, especially audiobooks. And so they'll only be able to have like one or two copies of that going out um, but this one anybody can do it so if you have libby or overdrive you can you can listen to that book if you want um, i will say it's not the easiest of books and maybe that's because a lot of the things that uh, happen in the book are things that are very similar to things that are happening and have happened in my own life with my own mother um, so it's been a really kind of emotionally charged uh, time as I'm listening to this and I'm preparing for the presentation. And so I'm going through old blog posts and old Facebook posts and old Instagram posts and finding pictures of things and kind of pulling things together and determining what to share and what not to share. So, um, yeah. It's been a little bit like, what did I do to myself? Um, but not in a terrible way. I think it's good to take time every once in a while to go back and kind of, you know, be mindful of where you come from and who you are as a person and as a maker. So it's been super helpful in that way. Um, and you might be noticing that William's not here. Um, surprise. Um, but if you didn't hear, he is um, taking a pottery class. So uh, maybe two years ago, we took a workshop with Amy Rodman down at Main Exhibit Gallery and um, did some pottery classes. And one of the things that's been super important to me on my journey lately has been to reinvest in uh, educational opportunities and creative entrepreneur um, kind of enrichment uh, opportunities. So 
uh, one of the things that we did to do that was we, I created a series called the Storyteller Collection, and that's available online right now um, at allegorygallery.com. If you haven't seen it so far, head on over there maybe after the video is over and check that out. Um, and uh, the sales of those pieces help fund classes for both me and William. So it's not just me, it's him too. So he's um, uh, right there or getting ready to go to his pottery class tonight. So um, I decided, or we decided that it would be nice if I did Wednesdays since he's at his other class. And uh, it's just another uh, time for us to be together. So I think that's nice. All right. So I see a couple of folks have tuned in. If you're watching, say hello. I always love to hear um, who's watching and where people are tuning in from. Uh, I think it's super nice when we kind of form those communal kind of community bonds with each other. And, um, you know, that's nice. So I see a couple folks watching. S Sandra's watching. Hey, Sandra. Michelle's watching. Hi, Michelle. Karen's watching. Hi, Karen. Marianne's watching. Hi, Marianne. Um, Norma's watching. Hi, Norma. Cheryl's watching. Howdy, Cheryl. If you didn't see, Cheryl, if you are not in our group, our Allegory Gallery Design Challenge group, um, you should definitely join that because it's a really cool kind of uh, fun virtual hangout spot for us. Um, and we talk about all things Allegory Gallery. And Cheryl posted her necklace, which was inspired by the tutorial that I did yesterday. So I thought that was pretty cool. Um, and she's also posted some really cool pieces that she's made um, off of the Saturday morning tutorials on YouTube with our teacher, Jen. So that's pretty fun. So if you haven't checked out her designs there, definitely head on over there, maybe after watching today and check them out. And always leave, you know, it's nice if you can leave a comment, you know, even if it's something simple, you know, I'm guilty of being a lurker myself, but um, I try to always leave comments on other people's posts, even if it's just like, good job, or keep going, or, you know, sometimes I'll add more if, if people are kind of, are, um, are open to that but sometimes i don't try to add too much because sometimes that can deflate people's balloons um so i always try to uplift other people and encourage them especially when they're making because i know how important it is for me as a maker uh to get that kind of uh interaction and plus people uh bo boost things up in the algorithm and people see posts more so that also is a helpful um, social media networking tool. So, um, and then if you leave, and there's some, if you leave um, comments that are four words or more, that also helps boost it up too. So that's another little, little tip or trick um, to help things get seen more, but also to build community. It's always nice when you can, you know, share ideas and words of encouragement with one another. I think that's super important. Um, yeah, June's watching. Hey, June. Susan's watching. Hi, Susan. Um, our neighbor Susan's watching. Hey, Susan. Susie. Bonnie's watching. Hey, Bonnie. Paula's watching. Hi, Paula. Donna. Hi, Donna. Julie's watching. Hey, Julie. Suzanne is watching. Hi. Hi, Suzanne. Um, Michelle says, I've been missing so many lives. Happy to be here today. Oh, I'm happy that you're here as well. It's always nice. I, you know, um, 
our numbers with our lives have dropped pretty significantly. Um, it was in the past couple months and sure there's other circumstances, but at one point we had kind of talked about what if we, what, you know, what if the time of lives is kind of over and how should we reposition ourselves? Um, you know, if nobody's watching, then what's the point kind of thing. And both William and I kind of decided together that we would keep doing it for as long as possible because we love the community um, that we're building together here and that it's always lovely to have those social interactions with each other. And, you know, it's, we've become, uh, it's more than just um, like a selling thing or, you know, more than just another live on Facebook at least for us. I don't know if y'all feel that way, but we've become kind of a little circle of friends and family. And I think that's a beautiful thing. And in a world that's oftentimes very divisive, I think it's important when we have those opportunities to share that kinship and camaraderie um, that we take advantage of those and help build those. Susan says, hello, Andrew, William, kiddies, and at all, and, and let's see, who else? Trying to catch up on the comments before we jump into everything. I always like to take a couple minutes to go through people saying hello. Um, I think it's nice. It's nice to be greeted, so I try to do my best. Um, Susan says, I received my second of your paintings, Andrew. Me, that's me, I'm Andrew. I'm trying to decide where to place it. I'll photograph and post on the design challenge page after I do. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you so much. It really means a lot to me that people seem to be resonating with these pieces. Um, it always uh, gobsmacks me when people want to have a piece that I've created. I think that's, I'm always a little bit surprised. I know I probably shouldn't be, should, but, um, you know, it's always surprising to me when somebody's like, I want that. And I want that to be a part of my life, or I want that to be part of somebody else's life that I care about. Um, so it really does mean a lot to me. And then also knowing that those things are going to go towards my future education and William's education and um, the uh, equipment and tools here at Star Cottage Studio, um, it definitely fills me with a sense of gratitude. Um, and we are deeply humbled by it. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you to everybody who got um, some of my recent paintings, directly goes towards helping us. And um, we're so thankful for that. So thank you. I'm broken record time, but you know, it didn't, you know, that it, it is what it is when it comes to that. Um, Susan says, Smokey Cat is sitting on me and listening to you. Oh, good. I miss my cats, but the, I know that, um, they would be getting into everything if they were here. And um, I, we're getting kittens soon, hopefully. Fingers crossed that their tests come back negative. Um, but I'm also remembering when our kittens went through and destroyed everything when they were in their baby time. So I'm kind of like, oh my gosh, I need to clean the house and kitten-proof everything. Um, so expecting parents, what to expect when you're expecting. I can get that book, Expecting Kittens, LOL. Um, Donna says, hello from Oklahoma. Hi. Um, Sandra said, it also lets others know when you leave comments that it's a good place to be. I agree. Uh, Carlene is watching. Hello. 
it jumped. Um, Susan says, I'm very much appreciate and enjoy these lives. I would miss it if you stopped. I think we would miss it too. Bunny says, it's really fun to connect with other crafty folk. Karen says, I agree with you. Susan said, these lives do build community. I think so. You know, it's weird. Um, uh, you know, as an entrepreneur and a small business owner, sometimes it seems like, you know, you're in a very transactional kind of, I don't know, uh, I don't want to say a business because it is a business, but it seems very transactional, and, you know, in the sense that I have something to sell and other people have something to buy and, you know, that exchange. But I think something that's been always important to me and William is fostering a sense of community and doing more than just selling stuff. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, but I've never, when we started this business, it's never been about like how much money we can make. And that's probably not the best thing to do when you're going into business. Um, but we've been here for 12 years, so um, it's you know, I think it, there's something to this. Um, Harry says, hello. Hi, Harry. Um, Marianne says, I agree, Susan. Oh, good. Uh, Michelle says, it's so important for makers to say social. Many of us are not out and about as a rule. Yeah, I sometimes, I'm very isolated in my studio. Um, and so oftentimes it feels like I'm like shouting into the wind and you never know when something you say, do or make will resonate with somebody. You usually, you know, you never know. You, and sometimes you know because it resonates negatively with people and they're not afraid to vocalize that. Um, but you never know. So it's nice to be able to have these these places where we can connect and talk with one another and build those relationships. Because those are important, I think. Sandra says, I got my painting and I adore it. Oh, good. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm glad that you like it. Susan says, Bonnie, I agree totally. Hannah's watching in Sweden. Hello. Uh, it's almost midnight and she, she might fall asleep. Well, thanks for winding down your evening with us. That's always nice, I think. Sometimes I do that when I'm just about to go to go to bed. I'll, I'll watch something. Uh, the, the technique that I'm showing is not like the most action-packed, exciting. So you, I might be very uh, adept at lulling you to sleep. It'll be like the lullaby by Andrew. Uh, Bonnie says, my dear painting is on my work board in my craft room to inspire, eventually going to the cabin. I just love it. Oh, good. I'm glad you like it. Um, one of the things that we have been kind of talking about as like a secret thing that we haven't really announced yet. So I don't know how much I'm allowed to say. Um, I guess I can say whatever I want because if it works out, it works out. If it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. Um, but a long time ago, I used to be involved with this group called Art Bead Scene. And uh, our friend Heather Powers was kind of like the the leader of that charge. And one of the things that they did is every month they would pick a piece of artwork and then they would post that piece of artwork and then people would create things inspired by that artwork. And for a while we did something similar when we were having shows more frequently, we would pick a piece of artwork from the show and then post that and then people would make things inspired by that. And we've been talking about maybe having me create a piece every month or, you know, make a series of pieces or go back in time and find some pieces that I've made and post those and use that as a prompt. Um, 
one of the things that I think is really good about looking outside of uh, things that are already related in the thing that you're doing. So if you're making jewelry, um, I think it's super important to look at other things than just making jewelry. So look at painting and how people paint, you know, read books. That's like the whole uh, premise of the Inspired by Reading group that we help post. Um, and it's one of those things where when you start broadening your, your field of vision, you start to see that there are more opportunities for inspiration than just the things that are like designed to make the thing to make the thing. Does that make sense? Um, so I think it's good. Um, Hana said that she's been wanting to buy stuff, but the postage is so expensive. I know. Um, yeah, that's been a, a constant struggle, especially with the pandemic. Um, we try to keep our shipping as low as possible um, and to work with people, but especially when it's an international order, um, you know, there, there's not much that we can do. Maybe if you order something and we save up enough money, we'll sleep on your couch and hand deliver it. Um, I look at that. Um, there's um, a feed on Instagram and it's like cheap old houses. And then there's like houses abroad. And so I look at places. Um, there's one, they oftentimes post things in Sweden and they look so charming. Um, but I think you have to be like somewhat independently wealthy to do that. I don't know, but I just got this, this suspicion that you have to, like some of the places you have to prove that you can like, you have enough money so that you can actually live there without being a burden to society kind of thing. And there is this place in Italy and they're basically giving houses away. But the stipulation is that you have to be able to afford to fix that building up and then be able to be self-sufficient. So I was like, ah, uh, maybe someday, but not today. Um, Harry says, I framed the first one and it is right beside me as I sit here. The cat in the stars is just the thing. I love cats and astronomy. Oh, good. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate that. And if you haven't seen, Harry has been doing his own, um, uh, interpretations of the gel press and doing some collages and mixed media work. So it's really cool. Um, so I definitely recommend you check out his feed um, and also check out his Etsy shop. That's Oscar Crow. And um, he's got all kinds of goodies there. Jewelry and ceramics and all kinds of things. Norma says it's a win-win. We get lovely pieces of art and you get to take classes. Yeah, I think so. And hopefully the things that I learn in the classes, I can then help. I'm not going to like share other people's like trade secrets and things like that because I know the importance of when you take a class not to then take something that somebody's charging money for and then distribute it for free on the internet. But I also think that there's um, value in learning that is not associated to a dollar amount and those things you can then um, help share and hopefully inspire other people as well. Um, let's see, I'm gonna try to catch up. Um, Susan says, my Phil is two and I'm still sleep deprived because he still knocks stuff off the nightstand and dresser during the night. He doesn't do that on my hubs, just me. Oh no. Marion says, Phil just showing you that he loves you, Susan. Um, Susan says, Michelle, I don't have anyone in my immediate real life circle who is a maker. These lives are great for me. Yeah, I think that's always, it's nice when if you can't find community locally, you can find community um, 
with others who may not be, you know, right next door. Um, we're super lucky that Ligonier is a very artsy town. And for being such a small town, we only have 1,500 people in the borough. Um, we have tons of artists. So it's super cool that there are a lot of people. We're all usually too busy making stuff in our own studios to peek up outside. But um, I feel lucky that within our region, we have tons of artists. And in Pittsburgh, there's a ton of metalsmiths and um, jewelry makers. And it's really cool to see what everybody can do when they kind of work together. So it's really, I think we, we feel really fortunate to be um, where we are. Marianne says, I hope to get my first two by Friday. You never know. Um, Michelle says, I remember that site. And what a great idea about posting a painting and have it and be a source of inspiration. We'll see if it if I can keep it up because um, sometimes when we get super, super busy, I don't always have as much time to make as I would like. You know, it's that's one of the trickiest things is finding that balance. Um, we, uh, when we first started the business, I thought, oh, I'll be making jewelry all the time. And I actually started making less jewelry when we opened the store. Um, and that's because we, I just, there are other responsibilities. So luckily we've gotten to a point where we've kind of divvied up our roles in the business and businesses. And hopefully um, we'll get some more help soon and we'll be able to kind of specialize even more into different things. Um, and then hopefully, you know, you do even more things, you know? Um, all right. I'm going to skip ahead um, because I don't want to get too, too bogged down in, um, in, 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 uh, the talk talk and then not get into any of the, the, um, the actual technique for the people who watch for that. I know for us, we were usually, we talk a lot. So, um, which I like, but I know that's not everybody's cup of tea. Um, Bonnie, so they say that about bait shops. Once you open one, you never have time to fish. Yeah, so that's one of the things is we're always, always so busy now. I know. I thought I was busy before. I used to work um, in the restaurant industry and I was a manager. And since I was on salary, I would have to like cover other people's shifts. And um, sometimes I would be like working doubles and sometimes like triples because you had to do like pre opening prep work and closing uh, duties also. So I would be there from like six in the morning until three o'clock at night kind of business. And um, yeah, I don't miss that. But I realized that I probably work more now being self-employed than I ever did before. And I used to complain all the time that I never had time to do anything. And yet, here we are. Luckily, I don't have to sleep that much. I'm, I don't sleep as much as most people, I think. And so I have a couple extra hours in my day. Um, but yeah. All right. So I'm going to flip this around. If you would be so kind to like and share these videos, um, William tells me that this helps with the algorithm and all the YouTube people we watch always tell people to like and share things. So I'm going to tell you to like and share things um, so that people watch things and then we make money 
and then we can maybe retire one day and have luxury. I don't know. Like and share so that people watch these videos. Otherwise, we'll stop doing them. All right. So I'm going to flip this around, and here we go. One day we'll have like, I'll be able to figure out how to do this more seamlessly. So I've pretty much left all the stuff out from yesterday. If you didn't see those, we made this one first, this kind of little abacus eye of protection um, pendant. If you wanted to scale these down or if you're not afraid of slightly heavy earrings, you could turn these into earrings by adding an ear wire. I also showed we kind of went off script, y'all, and we made this this as well, which basically takes the same things that we did in this pendant design, but modified them slightly and came up with a very different looking uh, component. So I think that that is a good thing when you can kind of do like variations on a theme um, and then you can kind of play around with the designs and tweak things um, and have fun. Now, I will say, I know some people are not a fan of eyes. I like them. I like the, they call it the evil eye, but it's supposed to bounce off negativity um, and protect you from bad ill intentions. So it sounds ominous, um, but it's actually supposed to be a good thing. It's like a good luck thing. So, yeah. And so this is part of our global adventure kit. Our global adventure kit, there's still a bunch more left. So if you didn't get one, you should get one because there's a bunch more left. And I maxed out that budget on that kit. So um, thinking that people would like it. And we didn't really sell that many of them. So if you want it, they're available. All right. Um, yeah, so I made this yesterday, and then today we're going to use some more of these beads in a project. How about it? All right, so this is going to be a simple knotting um, project. I know some people are going to be bored to tears um, because it's not going to be traversing any new territory. However, I think it's fun and it's useful. And I like to show this because it's one of those things that's very satisfying once you get going. Um, and yeah, I think it's, it's you know, sometimes it's good to revisit the basics. Um, I will preface this by saying that I am not um, a nodding guru. There are people who are, that's all they do is they all, all they do is nodding. And so they are like in it to win it. And I'm kind of like the poser. Um, but um, I like to do it. And I've used this technique before, um, not necessarily with um, jewelry techniques. I've used this nodding technique uh, to make um, mobiles, mobiles, mobiles. <laughs> Um, and I've created these fun kind of like, uh, wind chimey things and sun catchers, and I've used this nodding technique. All right. Um, all right. So here is a clipboard. This is, as you can see, we I probably found this at like a yard sale or a thrift store or whatever. It is not the most beautiful uh, thing, but it is super useful. So we will be using a clipboard. Um, if you don't have a clipboard, you can definitely pin your work down. Um, there are different things that you can do that will clamp. There are other ways that you can do it. Uh, Stephanie Sursich, which is another amazing artist um, who is, does awesome nodding work. Um, as well as lamp, this bright, colorful, candy-like lamp work glass beads. Um, she sells a board that is, I don't know if I have it 
conveniently located. But she sells a board that you can pin into and um, it keeps things. I'm looking around y'all, I'm looking around. I don't see it, but um, I know I have one and it's here in the vicinity somewhere. But anyways, if you wanna use that one, you can use that one. And you just have to make sure that you pin it right so that things don't come loose. I like the clipboard. Um, and when not those wrap bracelets were super popular, we used uh, the clipboard to kind of weave things in and out. And that was super handy dandy. Um, I know some people just go and they free, free form, do it off the, off the cuff kind of business. But I will say that this clipboard has seen a lot of action um, and it's a useful thing. You don't necessarily think of a clipboard as being a useful jewelry tool, but um, I think they're, they're pretty handy dandy. All right. Um, all right, so the next thing we're gonna do is we're going to need some waxed Irish linen. This is cobalt, um, and it's a four ply. And I have about five yards of it here, but I'm probably going to be cutting some off. We do sell wax Irish linen in the shop. I don't know if there's a link for it in the online store, um, but I think we sell like two meters of it. I don't know, but this is a uh, four ply wax Irish linen. And um, some people love it and some people hate it. I like it, but I also can see why sometimes people don't like it. And I'm going to tell, I'm going to let you in on a secret that may improve your relationship with wax Irish linen. One of the most common complaints that I get about not wanting to use wax Irish linen is that it feels gross um, and that it feels sticky and they don't like that kind of gummy texture. Now, the wax is actually super important to um, the, uh, the linen. So not only does it provide a lubricant to go through and not get super tangled up, but it will also, when you create a knot, it will help lock it in place but it also protects the fibers. So wax, um, especially natural beeswax, has a humectant in it and it's a preservative. So um, there are things that have been treated with wax that have uh, lasted for centuries. Um, and before they went to petroleum-based waxes in the British Museum, there is a product called Renaissance Wax, and it was developed, excuse me, um, to um, protect the armor in the British uh, Museum. Uh, before they had that, they would use beeswax. Um, so, you know, it's one of those things where it's, you may not like it, but it serves a purpose. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to measure off maybe, um, let's see, four feet of this. So I've got my handy dandy ruler and I'm doing that. One, two, three, four. Now you always have to assume that um, when you're working with this in this particular way, you're going to need, um, it's going to be halved, and then you're going to get less length as you knot because each knot takes up some of that material. So just keep that in mind. I always think it's good uh, to have more than you necessarily need because it's more tricky to add after than to cut away later. And I've seen people, they spend a lot of time nodding and doing all this kind of stuff. And then they get super frustrated 
and that when they get to the end and it's not long enough and then they end up with this like micro mini choker and they're like oh gosh darn it blast it all and yeah so also i should mention um that we're going to need super sharp cutters um and i've got these these are maybe not the sharpest but they will serve today. But you want this to be super sharp because if you have a dull pair of craft scissors that you stole from some child on the street, um, it's going to create this raggedy end and it's going to be super blunt and it's going to make your life feeding the beads through a nightmare. And then you're going to be like, why did Andrew tell me to do this? Why he do this to me? He must hate me. Um, so use the sharp cutters. Sharp cutters are super good. Um, hopefully these are sharp enough. I'm cutting this at an angle. And the reason why I'm cutting this as an angle is because I want to make this end of this, um, this, uh, this uh, end of my wax linen to be a needle of sorts. So as Michelle pointed out, um, you can use a piece of brown craft paper and you can run your piece through your working thread through this paper and it takes off the excess of the wax, but it also further impregnates the wax linen with the wax so you're pushing it into the fibers and working it in there the other thing is is that you're uh you're also stretching out your linen and you may think oh you don't why would you want to do that it's like you know when you get a t-shirt and then you stretch it out over time and then by the time you know you've had it for 10 years it's down to your your knees where it didn't used to be like that or if you, um, the neck line of a shirt becomes like a scoop neck instead of, a, you know, a crew neck or whatever they call it. But the thing about um, kind of stretching it out this way, and what I'm doing is I'm holding it in between my thumb and forefinger, and I'm just running it through like this, and I'm running it through a couple different times, is I'm pre-stretching this out. And what that's doing is when I'm going to work with my piece um, and I'm knotting, it won't stretch out over time. And so you, um, sometimes I've seen this happen because I've done this, is I've knotted pieces and then I wait a couple years or whatever and I notice that what I thought was nice and tight knots beforehand and everything's all tight and um, the knots are all close together with the beads and all that, um, I learned is that sometimes over time, the weight of the beads and gravity will stretch things out. So not only does this take off the excess sticky feeling and also impregnate the fibers further with wax, but we're also doing a little bit of pre-stretching. Um, as you can see, the color is color fast. That's super important that you get a, if you're working with fibers, that you work with a color fast fiber. Cause I've seen where people have used things and they use these dyes. I don't know how they're dyeing their stuff, but um, maybe they're trying to do an over dye or something. But if it, somebody starts sweating and then the color bleeds on the white shirt, I've seen it. Don't think, don't think it's impossible because I've seen it. And it looks pretty horrifying. It actually looks pretty cool, but it's probably not what you want if you have a nice uh, light colored uh, shirt. And then you s start seeing the drippy, the drippy time. So... Donna says, could you please repeat the length you cut? I cut four feet length. And generally speaking, I do a wingspan, but because I'm folding this in half, I'm finding both ends of this. I'm gonna match these ends up and I'm going to um, 
match these ends up like so. And then I'm gonna run my fingers through and find the middle point of my, my length. All right, and this is cobalt if you were wondering. All right, so the next thing I'm gonna do is I've got my, um, the toggle, the, half of the toggle that is included in this global adventure um, mix. So it's a global adventure mix for Turkey. And it comes with this AG fine pewter eye-shaped toggle. All right, I'm gonna take this loop that I have, the center point loop, and I'm going to pass it through the bail on the toggle. And then I'm gonna open up my loop and then I'm gonna take my two ends here and pass this back through. And this is what's called a lark's head knot. Now, if you do it and nicely, I kind of messed that up, I twisted it. I'm gonna undo it real quick. I mean, it doesn't matter really because um, if there's a slight twisting of it, um, it doesn't, it's not gonna be the end of the universe. But you do wanna keep it so that when you've passed it through, it's not gonna get all twisted up because I found that um, if you start a twist early on, as you go, your piece will twist. So if it doesn't really matter with this technique because it's very free-formed and very forgiving, but with something that has like a pattern, if you're trying to keep that pattern, it's gonna start twisting around so just make sure that when you're pulling this, this large head knot, that um, the pieces aren't crossed over one another. And then it creates this nice, I don't know if you can see it. Can you see it? It creates a nice little, it looks like, the way that I think of a lark's head is that that's like the eye hole and the skull, and then this is the beak. So that's how I think of it when I think of a lark's head knot. So I talked about this um, clipboard being a super handy dandy useful tool, and it is. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna clip my toggle, the end in, um, and I'm gonna make sure that I don't clip too far down into my um into my thread because i've done that before where i've clipped it over my thread and then as i'm knotting then there's a big gap here at the top so that's less than ideal um so what i'm going to do is an easy peasy overhand knot so i'm just going to take one um thread and i'm going to go over it and I'm going to pull this up. And then I'm going to do this on the other side. And it kind of creates a P shape. And I'm going to keep doing this alternating until I get about six, six of these pulls in. And I'm told you this is not, this is not like the most beautiful of knotting that you've ever seen. But I like it because, um, you know, it has a kind of a rustic bohemian vibe. It's kind of like friendship bracelets. Do y'all remember those? Um, and so I forgot what knot I'm on, but it doesn't really matter too much. I just want there to be enough clearance in between where my beads start and where my toggle is so that when I go to put my toggle through, it's not all bound up with beads. So if you put beads right up against your toggle, especially the toggle bar, it's gonna make it incredibly difficult to sometimes uh, open and close your toggle. So you don't want to have the headache time. Save yourself from the headache time. All right, so when you get this first initial couple knots made, um, you'll pull your, your threads together and kind of match it up. If you've done your job correctly, these ends will line up together, uh, which means you've alternated from doing this one to this one to this one to this one. And that 
that may not make sense because I just this one to this one to this one doesn't sound very specific. But if you alternate between which ones you pull up and you do or not, it'll be equal. If you only do one side and you just pull up one side, you're going to get a spirally twist, which is super cool. However, the problem with that is that if you do that, one is going to be real short and one's going to be real long. And that's how you do those kind of spirally friendship bracelets. Um, but this, with this technique, you want your ends to match up. Um, it's not the end of the world. You can, if you don't, you can always trim it. You've given yourself extra room. But one of the things that I do is I kind of press these together and then I spin them slightly. And you want to spin, hopefully, in a direction that's not going to unravel your wax linen. But if there's enough wax, it will help hold those two together. Um, and then you take that through and then you can twist your beads onto your, your kind of makeshift needle. And in theory, it should pop through unless you get one that has like the super tiny hole and then it won't do it, especially if you're trying to do this as a demo on camera. You're going to find every bead that has this most tiny hole ever. All right, so that that's not ideal. All right, so let's see if this will work. All right, these ones work. Thank goodness. All right, so I'm going to pull this all the way up. And then I'm going to take this apart like so. It's splayed out with like a Y. And then I'm going to do an overhand knot and pull this up like so. And then I'm going to do another one to lock it in place. All right. And then I'm going to pull these back down together. And if you can't fit these one at a time or together, sometimes you can fit them um, and do them one at a time and you can use them to pull each other up. Um, but it can be tricky sometimes. So I'm just going to pull this and push it all the way as far as it will go. And then I'm going to do another overhand knot. And I'm going to alternate between which ones I'm using as my kind of the one that goes overhand so that I can create that um, so that they're even. All right. And so basically you just do this over and over until you're happy with the length. Now... So there, there's that. I mean, that's not the most groundbreaking of um, techniques, but I think it's pretty fun. And uh, I think it's one of those things that's addictive um, when you're starting. Now, one of the things that's nice about this way of knotting is that if you sometimes you have to use an awl or a nail to move your knots with this one since you're working with two two threads this will help pull the knot down as close as possible um, if you're working with just one thread or you're working um where you're working the one thread over um, and that's going to be the one that's creating the knots and not the two, then you can, sometimes your knot will be way far down. And then that's where you have to take your nail or all or whatever and knotting tool and pull it up. But with this technique, if you do it um, this way, then you have less likelihood of needing to do that. Sometimes you have to do it, you have to adjust your knots if they're real far down. But this is almost, if you can tie your shoes, then this is, um, you know, this is for you. It's one of those things that it looks, it looks more complicated than it really is. Um, and then once you know how to do it, it's like a trick. People are like, oh, that's, that's so cool. I saw people, they charge like, 
thirty dollars an inch or something wild. I don't know if you can get the money, get the money, but for nodding, but uh, I don't know. I guess it takes time. Now, if you have issues where if it's clamped in the metal and it slips out, once you get those first knots in, then you can come over and you can squeeze it. The one thing you should be, I should probably do this. I should probably show you this. Is that if you take um, that piece of paper that we used earlier and you use that to cushion um, the, the working thread, then you, over time, sometimes if you're working, this uh, clip can cut into your wax Irish linen, and then you have the infinite sadness when you have finished your, your necklace, and then all of a sudden you have to, um, you have your, your toggle comes off because you've accidentally cut your thread inadvertently. So let's see if this will fit. Some of the holes, you know, they're not going to fit. If you have a problem with it fitting, you can try going from the other direction. Sometimes that's helpful. Sometimes finding, pulling one through and then forcing it through gently after it will also help. Um, And if you do end up with a length that's longer, I've ended up, I must have not been paying attention, but I ended up with one that's a little bit longer. I'm going to take that one and I'm going to use the longer one to create my knots. So I'm going to do it again. Um, Bonnie says, back in the old days, they paid people to string beads and pearls. Um, they still pay people to string pearls and beads. Um, but one of the reasons why they did that is because what they had to knot in between uh, their pieces is because um, it was just an understanding that your piece would eventually break. So they didn't have stuff like soft blacks or flexible beading wire that um, was braided steel with a nylon coating. So um, they had, you know, cotton or wax linen or what have you. And if over time, even if you're, if you don't even wear your pieces, sometimes because you don't wear your pieces, your jewelry can get what's called dry rot. So um, even if you're not, if you're using silk, which is an incredibly strong material by itself, I mean, they, uh, it's one of the strongest natural fibers, um, it can still dry rot and then your piece will break and then uh, ends up like that scene out of um, the Witches of Eastwick where that lady's wearing the pearl necklace at the top of the stairs and then her necklace breaks. And then um, then she falls down the stairs. You know that one? The mean lady in the town. Um, she ends up falling down the stairs because her pearl necklace was not knotted. So if you are working with natural fibers, it's super handy to have... Um, it's super handy to have your um, beads or pearls be knotted because um, if they fall down, then you're going to have to play seek, hunt and seek and find and find um, all your, your beads. All right, that one's a little bit too tight. I'm not going to struggle. I have other things in my life that I want to accomplish. All right. Susan says, I used to string pearls at a jewelry store in Ligonier when I was younger. That's cool. So you should be teaching this. You know exactly how to do this. Probably better. You got all the tips and tricks. Um, you know, when I was a kid, macrame was kind of like, 
it was cool, but it was on its way out. And then after nowadays, like macrame is super popular again. And so things like nodding um, are definitely um, something that um, is very popular now. And I think part of why things that are like hand oriented, like nodding or macrame or, or that kind of um, repetitive motions is because there's something very meditative about it and very therapeutic about doing something with your hands. Um, I think that that's super important. Um, for me, when I'm doing this, I kind of zen out and kind of, you know, uh, this is something that you don't necessarily have to pay super close attention to. So um, I think it's something that is useful to relax. I find it relaxing. Some people don't like it because they, they don't like that, but I find it super relaxing. And I think in this world that we live in, you know, there's so much going on and there's so much this uh, divisiveness where we're constantly being pulled apart. And there's kind of like this psychological warfare that's happening to us, even if we, we're, you know, we're not necessarily active participants in it. Um, and I think there's like this need, this primal kind of need to go back to the things that, um, you know, are satisfying and, um, you know, things that you can have control over and have that kind of handwork and be able to do things that are going to kind of create that Zen um, mindset. Um, so, yeah, I think it's it's one of those things I've seen happen more and more lately. More people doing things like nodding or crocheted ne necklaces or things like that, because there is something to be said about being able to kind of go into the that flow space in your mind um, and not, um, you know, not have to worry. I mean, it can be frustrating if something doesn't work out. Like if something starts slipping or sliding or your knots aren't working or you get a kink in your, in your thread or, you know, there are a lot of things that could happen that can be sources of frustration. But ultimately, this is a very kind of, I think it's a relaxing meditative practice. Um, and sometimes you'll find that your holes will not always be evenly drilled. And that's kind of the bane of my existence when it comes to stuff like this. Because you can, it can be great big hole on one side and then um, on the other side, it can be a, like micro mini time. And then you have to do like a, you have to kind of like finagle. And it doesn't impart that sense of zen, zenness. Um, Bonnie said, one of my favorite movies was called A Patch of Blue with Sidney Poitier and a very young woman who is blind and with string beads to make money. That's cool. I don't think I know that movie. But my memory is starting to go. I don't know about y'all. I used to have a really good memory, but nowadays, I don't know. I'm like, who am I? Where am I? What did I do? I was reading my old blog post and I was like, who wrote these? These are good. Um, I just got a notice that I need to plug my phone in. So I'm going to plug my phone in real quick. Um, if you didn't see what I did with this one, is I strung one of the waxed Irish linen in first. And then I use that to help guide the second one through. So you can make it work if it's tight. It's not as 
as quick and as satisfying as if they both kind of line up and want to go through the beads evenly. But sometimes you start running out of beads or you want a certain bead and it won't work. Um, some of these beads, like the polymer clay beads that I, that I'm, that I have in my hands right now, um, if you run into a problem with it, you can use a bead reamer. And if you gently remove uh, material from the hole, you can make the hole bigger. Um, with the glass, you can kind of do it. Um, you can do that if you use a diamond reamer. And I would suggest doing it underwater um, so that if it flicks, it doesn't flick in your eyes or create kind of um, dust. Um, but, so yeah, you can make the holes bigger on some things. But, um, and what I'm doing just now is I found the string that was a little bit longer, and then I used that, the longer one, to create the knots and that's going to create, make it more even when it comes down to the end. Um, Marion says, and now I have to change my phone. So switching to TV. Yeah, that's the thing with these long ones. Let's see, I love these ones, but the holes are kind of small, but I want, I'll, I'll try to make it work. If I can't get it to work, I'll show you that trick again. All right, so that one's clearly not working. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the longer one and place that above the other one and twist it like that. So you kind of have like a one that guides it through. And that's a way that you can kind of sneak it through. And then you can just pull it. Because the wax linen will compress. It's just that the tip, it will sometimes not want to do that. All right. So there you go. Um, I may have cut off too short of a piece. But we'll just keep going. This is not a super long necklace, by the way. So if you are wondering about that, it is going to be, it's going to be probably 18 inches by the time we're done with it. And sometimes the holes get blocked. So you have to remove stuff that's in the holes that get kind of blocks the holes in there. Um, there's other knotting techniques that you can do, especially if you want to do one uh, like one strand at a time. And I've shown that before where we have an, there's an outside um, thread and there's an inside core thread. And when you knot, you have one thread going over. Um, but I, I like them both ways. Sometimes um, it's not always ideal to have the thread exposed. Um, because it can kind of create weak spots, but um, it also adds a visual element. So it's just up to you. All right. So, I mean, this is one of those things where I'm just going to keep going, adding beads until I can't. <laughs> um, so I, I didn't prepare a sample ahead of time. So We'll just have to knot as we go. Or we can make a bracelet. I mean, I mean, it's, it's too long maybe for a bracelet now, but I don't want you all to get bored. And then you're going to be like, oh, that Andrew, all his videos are so boring. It's like watching paint dry. Um, so hopefully you all are having a good week so far. It's weird being on a Wednesday. I keep thinking that it's the beginning of the week and then it's closer to the end in my mind. And um, part of that is the fact that the weekend is coming up super fast and I still have a lot of work to do. Um, whenever I do presentations, I like to go through 
And um, especially when it's in a group of people um, and I don't, you know, I do lives all the time. So I'm not necessarily nervous anymore, but I do like to go through things a couple times so that if there are any hiccups, I can kind of troubleshoot those as I go. And so um, that's on the back of my mind is this presentation um, cause I want to do a good job, you know, maybe they'll ask me back. Um, Suzanne says, I have cracked a bead using an awl. Yeah, that, you, that's a thing that happens sometimes. Um, so if you have an awl, the awl is not ideal, um, if you use a bead reamer, it's um, where things are a little bit um, perforated with a texture. And then you can use that to scrape away some of the material. Um, there's a couple of things that you can do to help with the success of that. Sometimes having it underwater or with lubrication will help. Um, and then sometimes, you know, things, there are defects in the things that you can't see with the, the naked eye. And then you go to do it and then, then you find out. Um, so that's not always ideal. Suzanne says, I tend to have a heavy hand. Uh, that will also do it. I try, I don't know, I'm... In some ways, I have a heavy hand, and then in a lot of other ways, I have a lot of not a heavy hand. What's that? A light touch? What do you call a not a heavy hand? Um, finesse? I don't know. But, um, yeah. So, hopefully, y'all are having... And, you know, doing stuff. I don't know. We've uh, we finished watching the newest season of Sweet Tooth on Netflix. I don't know if y'all saw that. That was pretty good. Um, those kids are super cute. Um, and then we also watched um, Queen Charlotte. Did y'all watch that? Um, I don't know if y'all like that. Some people don't like romances, and this is definitely a period romance. Um, I didn't realize that that's what those books were, but though, like the Bridgerton books were romance novels, but they are straight up romance novels. And I guess that's my fault for not like I, I, making that connection since there is like sexy time all the time. Um, but yeah, I liked it. It was a pretty good show. I love the costumes. It is weird to see these different, um, historical figures, especially in the, in the Queen, um, Charlotte, um, show, um, to see those historical figures kind of depicted because oftentimes, you know, these, these people are, especially when you're coming at from like American history, like some of the things like they they kind of allude to like the colonies and like upsets in the colonies and then you're like oh that's a revolutionary war that they're they're alluding to and then you kind of think about i don't know i don't know if other people think about stuff like that um but yeah hannes is not boring i'm still awake oh good or not good. I guess it's a, it depends on if you want to be awake or not. Bonnie says, I'm getting a salad for dinner. I love Queen Charlotte, but had to close one eye during the sex scenes. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, they weren't too... T I guess it depends on your sensibilities. Um, I didn't think they were too, too... Um, risque but i have a different uh, mindset so 
anyways, when you get to a certain point and you start working your way down, you may encounter that your piece is getting too long. And this is one of those things, especially if you're doing like a wrap bracelet, you'll find that um, it's hard because like if you're dangling off the edge, then you're not gonna be able to get as much as the best tension possible. So what I suggest is uh, covering your piece with the paper and that will help um, insulate it from getting squashed. Um, I'm also using somewhat fragile beads. So I don't necessarily want to have the grip of life on them because um, if I do, I can crack them or hurt them or dent them or damage them. So I'm working off to the side where there isn't this kind of like, um, I don't know if you can see that or not. Let me adjust that. So um, there, there are these mechanical um, things in the way. So you can't necessarily go through the back. So if you go off to the side and kind of work at an angle, you can still have it grip the piece, but not have, and have this kind of dangle off the edge. Um, and you can still have it work and, and it won't be in the way. Um, Susan says, Bonnie, for me, it is bloody and violent scenes that force my eyes to close. Yeah, they're not so much in like Queen Charlotte, but there, um, yeah, there's plenty of stuff that I can't look at anymore. I used to have a much, uh, um, much more developed constitution, I guess, but nowadays some things just gross me out and I don't want to see it. Um, so I feel you on that. Um, all right. So I'm just going to keep going. We're going to kind of chat as we go. And yeah. So hopefully y'all are doing well. Have y'all been making anything or thinking about making anything? Oftentimes I think a lot about making things. Um, if you didn't see or hear the news, our fictitious name for the new building in Johnstown got approved. So we can actually say what it is now. Um, we were saying before what it was, kind of. But in theory, we probably shouldn't have. And it's called Butcher Block Gallery. And we're trying to get some funding lined up so that we can get some of the jeweler's benches in there. So what we kind of decided is that we would have the online store for Butcher Block Gallery and it would have contemporary jewelry. Um, right now, I don't know if Johnstown is necessarily a hot market for contemporary jewelry. Um, and, you know, uh, just being practical, it's not like a major metropolitan area. However, um, I do think that there is a sincere um, desire for people to learn some of the fabrication techniques. So there are things in metal smithing, like sawing and filing and things like that, and making some simple silver smithing that people would really respond well to. So what we're going to have is we're going to have some of the store devoted to um, showcasing contemporary jewelry, finished jewelry. And then in the center of the building, in the very kind of like running down the middle, we'll have the jeweler's benches and then um, we'll have classes um, from time to time. And my goal is to uh, maybe have a weekly class because I think that that's a great way to skill build. Um, but it might be a monthly class. We'll have to determine what people are interested in. Um, we'll also have it set up so that if people wanna take classes, um, they can use the bathroom. 
Like we thought about having classes here at the cottage and we still might do it. Um, but I think uh, one of the biggest hiccups is there isn't um, a bathroom. So people have come and visited before and taken kind of like crash courses in, in jewelry making from me. Um, our friend Helen, I don't know if she's watching or not, but she came once and we've had a couple other folks kind of come by and take classes. And there's a lot of people who are really interested in taking classes, but, um, you know, it's not necessarily good that we don't have running water or a bathroom. Um, and it's fine for me, you know, because I can just like run home or whatever. But for for like a um, for a student, um, especially a student um, with um, I don't want to with that you know may have different restrictions. Um, like sometimes people like who have like IBS or stomach issues. Um, you know, they need to have access to a functional bathroom wherever they go. And so we want to be accessible to as many people as possible and create a space that's kind of like open to all. Um, and that's just not possible at the moment. Um, and the toilet that we're thinking of getting is not designed for like heavy duty usage of like a lot of people. It's a very niche product that's like designed for like a cabin out in the woods. Um, and so we're still saving up for that. Um, we saved up a lot for it, but it's one of those things that I don't know. It always seems like there's something else that's going on that we need to put our money towards. Um, one of the things that we had to do or start thinking, I don't know if y'all know about this or not, because I don't know what I tell people and what I don't tell people at this point. Um, on the Patreon, um, I've probably told folks, but one of the things that we... Um, have to do pretty soon is um, we went um, to get an insurance quote. And one of the things that they do to determine your quote is they'll do like a site visit. And they said that to get our bill lowered, our insurance bill lowered, um, we would have to improve the outside exterior of the cottage. The inside's pretty good. I mean, it's super messy right now because I have everything strung out and I haven't really had a chance to unpack, unpack. It's been one of those things where it's like a get up and go. Like you got to run and make the money while you can make the money kind of thing. So I've slowly been unpacking and cleaning, but it's one of those things that's going to take a long time. And I'm pretty much doing it on my own. Like sometimes William helps, but I'm mostly doing a lot of the organizing and um, doing a lot of the cleaning on by myself. So it's just taking a really long time. So that's one of the reasons why it's kind of messy in here. But anyways, we have to redo the exterior and so one of the temporary kind of stop measures that we're thinking about is replacing all of the um, shingles that need to be replaced that like are disintegrating and then just painting the building. I would love, 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 love to redo all of the siding um, on the exterior and get everything insulated properly and weather tight and get everything kind of squared away but that's just not um possible right now so what we're gonna do is try to get what we can do and see what we can do on our own you know um so anyways that's one of the things that we're we've been we're gonna have to do this summer 
is work on the exterior of the cottage, which is not necessarily something I'm, I guess in some ways I'm looking forward to it, but in other ways, it's like straight up manual labor. And um, I'm not opposed to working hard and doing manual labor. I grew up, uh, my dad still has a landscaping company but I grew up working very hard um, in outside and in the weather and doing stuff like mowing lawns and um, and running chain link fences and doing stuff like that. So it's not something that's unusual for me. It's just something that I don't particularly enjoy, but we can't, we don't really have the budget to hire people yet, at least not like to do it all by themselves. It would be wonderful if we could do that. I keep hoping that we'll end up on like an extreme makeover show and they're like, oh, we're gonna totally renovate the cottage and you don't have to pay any money and you'll have a working bathroom. Um, you know, one can dream, right? LOL. Um, but, um, and then maybe they'll do like a, like a, a makeover for me to be like, oh, well, um, fix your teeth and um, remove your acne scars and buy you some clothes while we're at it um, that are not basically rags, which I don't really have a problem with. But whenever I go to like speaking engagements, I've noticed I get a lot of anxiety now because a lot of the stuff doesn't fit anymore of my old clothes. So the other night we went to this opening and I was super duper stressed because I couldn't find anything that fit. So that is, um, you know, funny. So that would be so cool dreaming of Chip and Joanna Gaines driving up with all the stuff. Yeah, that'd be awesome. I watched their shows. We used to watch Fixer Upper when we had regular TV. And then when we started streaming, we watched their shows on um, on HBO Max now. And I like them. I like their design aesthetic for the most part. I know some people don't like it, but I like it. Um, and also, uh, but more likely I'll probably end up on episode hoarders and then y'all going to see a new reality, a, a different side of me as I have to fight people. I once watched an episode of hoarders and the woman was a crafter and she had a fabric collection. I mean, she had a room that was devoted to her fabric collection and, um, you know, she, she quilted and made clothes and did all kinds of stuff and it made her happy. And then they were like, no, you have to throw out, you can only keep this amount of stuff and you have to throw out everything else. And so they took her fabric, this unused vintage fabric that probably you could never get again and threw it in a dumpster. And I was screaming at the TV because I was just imagining somebody going through my bead collection and throwing away my beads. And um, then I would have to fight people on the internet or the TV and then probably go to jail um, because nobody's gonna be taken and throwing away my stuff. It would be like, it would be on like Donkey Kong. It would be horrifying. You would see a feral side that y'all are Probably you you can imagine that it exists, but probably have not witnessed it in full fury form, full final form. But that would be it would be like you know that would be on. Um, Bonnie said that's going to be me, quarters crafting edition. And Norma said, that's just wrong. I know. I was, like, deeply upset for that woman because she'd spent 20-something years collecting this stuff. And even if you don't use it, I feel like, um, you know, I don't know. 
I don't, I don't necessarily think you have to use everything that you have. I think sometimes it's nice to have stuff that you use, but also sometimes it's just having a really cool collection. Um, it's kind of like a stamp collector. You don't expect stamp collectors to use, like you use the antique stamps in the mail. Um, sometimes it's nice just to have a, a stamp and have a stamp to be a stamp, you know? Or sometimes it's nice to see a bead and have it be small scale sculpture and be a, have it a part of your collection as opposed to something that you necessarily have to make something with. I mean, there's something to say, to be said for both um, ways of doing things, but at the same time, goodness gracious. All right, so I'm getting towards the end of this, and um, I don't want to go all the way to the very end, because if I go all the way to the very end, I'm going to have infinite sadness when I can't finish off my piece. So I do want to give myself a couple of inches at the end um, so that um, I have enough working thread so that when I go to put on the toggle, the bar of the toggle, it will work. Now, one thing that I am super duper duper surprised um, is that I have not had to trim the edges of this fabric off yet or this thread off yet. Normally, after I've been going through this many beads and making this many knots, it I will have to trim this and make sure that um, everything's at an angle. But thankfully, most of the beads had big enough holes that it was not a concern. But um, if there ever is a concern, um, just make sure to budget that in, you, when you're making your piece. And then you can make it just a little, you can give yourself a little bit more wax linen so that when you go to do it, and you trim it, you don't end up with little shorty stubs that you're going to regret. Now this necklace, I'm gonna add the toggle closure and then I'll, we'll talk about lengths. Um, so this is the bar that comes with it. Now I want you to look at this bar for a second because it's got a little micro mini hole, y'all. This is not what you call an ample girth that is gonna, you, you don't have a whole lot of clearance for that. You can fit this through for another Lark's Head Knot, but it is a smaller hole, so just be aware of that. I've had some people say, oh, well, I can't, because they'll do like a beaded loop whenever they do their closures. But this is a small, this is a small size toggle, all right, y'all? This is not grande size. This is un piquito size. So you're not gonna necessarily want, you're not gonna necessarily want a great big bale if your bar is only, you know, less than an inch long, all right? So just keep that in mind. Don't get discouraged or despair um, if it um, is um, not, uh, you know, if your hole is not that big. That sounds really weird, but whatever. We're all grown ups here. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I move this up on my board and that's so that I can um, have a good tension. Tension is super important to this project because if you're too loose, it can stretch, it can pull, your knots can come undone. So it's good to um, pull, um, be able to have that good tension, all right? And we're gonna alternate threads like how we started, one over the other, um, so that they're relatively the same length. And we're going to give ourselves a little bit of extra room, you know? With this, the clearance that we have to have, it needs to be able, this bar needs to be able to pivot and not, to pivot sideways and not get hung up on this bead. Because if it gets hung up on this bead, it's not going to smoothly and easily be able to go through, all right? Because if you have it where the bead is a great big bead, say you have this bead, well, it's attached, so. 
Say you have, let me see if I have any big beads within reach. I love these little mushrooms, by the way, and I hate to use them because I love them. Talk about hoarder, just a delight. But say you have this great big bead at the end, and this doesn't want to bend smoothly so that you can go through this hole, you're going to struggle putting this on and off. So if you have the slightest bit of mobility issues, you are asking for a headache. And if you're a customer, if you're making this to sell or to give away, as a gift, if they have any mobility issues, they're gonna be cursing her name, they're never gonna wear this necklace, and they might as well lit the money on fire. Um, so if you give yourself just a wee bit of space at the end of your piece so that your toggle bar can smoothly and easily turn to the side, then it can pass through the hole of your toggle and then um, then you'll be safe and secure. But if you put it and it's like right up against it, you're asking for trouble because this is not going to have the clearance to bend smoothly and easily. Does that make sense? Um, Pam said, that's awful to throw out fabric. Hopefully it was for shock value and they recovered it later. I doubt it. Some of those shows, they just be hog wild throwing stuff out. And I was like, you know, they probably could have got somebody on the eBay and done that. All right. So what I did is I matched up my ends as I threw that toggle bar. Where are they? Okay. I'm going to match up my ends. And because I've been working one thread over the other and then using the other thread and using that to be the working thread, my threads are pretty even at the end. They're pretty even at the end. So I don't have to worry about trimming anything. I get nervous about trimming stuff because the more you trim, the less you have to work with, right? All right, let me get this pretty, I don't know if I can get this close enough for you to see. All right, so I'll try to zoom in. Um. I can't really zoom. Well, here, let me lower this down. Um, so I've got both of these threads and I'm going to pass them through this end of the toggle. And then I'm going to go through this loop that I've created. And there's a loop here. And you may not be able to see it. And I'm gonna put my threads through that loop. All right, and then I'm gonna pull this down. And then I'm going to spread these apart. And where that loop, I didn't attach it fully. I'm gonna pass this individually around each, um, working thread. So I'm going to go back through and pull it and I've got another loop and then I'm going to pass that through this loop and then pull it. So that's going to secure it. So I'm going to do the same with this and you can kind of see it. I'm going to pull this up closer because I don't know if y'all can see this or not. So you have this working loop right here and so I'm going to go back through. And I'm going to go back under this and pass that through this loop I created and pull it. And it's going to be nice and sturdy. And when you make a knot in wax Irish linen, it's going to stay, y'all. All right. And then I've got these two threads. And I'm going to cross them over and um, make an overhand knot, which I just messed that up, but that's all right. So what I'm going to do is I can um, I can pull this super tight if you make a knot and it's not where you want it to be. Or I can um, and have it and trim it and have it be seamless. Or if you want this little dingle dangle that you're gonna 
um, if you want a little extra pizzazz, you can make a knot on one of these. String a bead on. And then make another knot. And sometimes that's helpful when you get the all or whatever piece of wire or something. And you can pull that down in there. So it's nice and tight. If you want that little dingle dangle at the end. And then if you want, you can trim it. I'm probably going to trim that off because I kind of hate those things. But it looks festive. But sometimes it feels like somebody is like tickling the back of your neck. So, um, you know, I like to keep it long enough so that I can have clearance for my toggle bar. If I feel like there's too much um, room here, I can always knot this again and again. And that's going to help eat up some of that fabric or that thread so that I'm not, I don't have this great big long tail here. So that's something um, that's going to happen, maybe. All right. So I've got this. It's all secure. And I can do this side, too. Oh, heck, why, why not? We've already done one side. We might as well do the other side. Um, I'll make this one shorter and use a smaller bead so that it can have a little bit of variation to it. it doesn't have to be all same, same. And then pass this back through this knot and this loop to make this knot. And then walk that down so that it's right nestled up against that bead, all right? And then you can take your fingernails and push that those knots to both sides of the beads. All right, and then if you need to, then just trim any excess. And there you go. And then um, adjust this so that it's not in the way. And there you go. So I'll zoom out so you can see it. Oh. All right. So this is a choker length. The finished length, let me get the ruler. You can see how small this is. Um, the finish length is, this is 12, and then this is, so it's almost 18 inches. So it's not too, too tight, but if you wanted to make this longer, you would just start off with a longer piece. Just remember you're folding that piece in half. So then, um, so when you fold that in half, that cuts that number in half. And then also imagine you're eating up an inch of material every time you make a knot. So there's two knots in between each of these beads. So, you know, that's two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. 12. You know, you can count through however much. Um, I'm not one of those people who can mathematically calculate every bead that I need and then do that for that ratio. Um, and also it depends how tightly you pull because sometimes that will give you more um, clearance. However, if you pull too tight and the holes are big, then your beads can slip over your knot. And so you don't want to pull too, too tight because if you pull too, too tight, then your beads can slip over your knots and that kind of defeats the purpose of having a knot in between. Um, having two knots in between helps add to the bulk of the knot so it doesn't slip over but yeah all right so and if you wanted you could make a pendant i don't know what do y'all think hang that off of there like that you just have to find the center and then put it add it with a jump ring 
And so that would go in between like so. You all like that? All right. I'm going to flip this camera around. We're going to say goodbye because I got stuff to do. I'm sure you all have things that you all want to be doing too. Um, I don't know if you all... are interested in doing a work with me um, because I've got some things that I'm, I've got kind of ideas I've got cooking. So let's put it on, put it on. That one nice thing about, um, so it is like a choker on me. So it's like 17 inches or so. So if you're gonna make this, I would suggest make it more longer unless you want it to be shorter like that. But I personally don't like these lengths anymore. When I was younger, I used to make all of my necklaces super short like that. As I get older, the longer and longer they get. So eventually they're going to be like down to my knees or beyond. Um, because I don't like this feeling of being asphyxiated. Um, but, I mean, if you like it, that's one way. It depends on, like, what you're wearing it with. Like, this would be, a, like, this neckline is would work well with this kind of length because it would hit right above that. But, you know, so we made that together. How do you all feel about that? Do you feel empowered and entertained? Or are you like, I could have been washing my hair one strand at a time? Um. Norma says, looks good, that length. I always feel like I'm choking, though. Same, same. Um, Susan says, I have to do no less than 20 inches. Same, same. Um, I don't like it to be too tight, but, you know, some people, they like it shorter. Um, and it does look nice on some people if it's, like, it hits just right, just above the super sternal notch. It looks real cool like that. Um but, you know, I don't know. I don't know about y'all. I don't like that that feeling. All right. So that's what we made today. Um, and we had a nice, lovely conversation. Thanks so much, everybody, for tuning in. Um, do you all want to watch? I'm, I might take a break to go home and eat something um, and then come back and then work. But I've been thinking about um, using, I made some texture sheets and steel um, that uh, in the Steven Yusko class that I just took. And I've been wanting, 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 wanting to um, use them. So I might, um, I might do that. I might just hang out. Um, I might just have it running. I may talk to y'all, may not. Sometimes when we do the work with me videos, it's good because I can just focus on what I'm doing. <coughs> See, I'm already choking myself just even thinking about this being so short. No, but sometimes um, the work with me videos are cool because I can just dial into what I'm doing and then I don't really have to interact because that takes a lot of like energy um to be like you know on instead of devoting it to the piece that i'm working on sometimes i feel like i have to entertain while i'm doing the tutorial so um so in some ways the work with me videos are nice that way i don't know i just find them dreadfully boring when you can't even talk to anybody and it's just like this silent like i don't know spy cam or something but William says that people like them, so I don't know what I'm going to do. I might have it going so that you all can see what I'm doing, but this is, would be all very experimental. So if I do anything that's kind of wackadoodle, you know, who knows? Maybe it works out, maybe it doesn't. Um, oh, I see people like the, the necklace. Cheryl says, love it. Thank you. Julie says, very nice. Thank you. Julie says, nice length. Thank you. Gloria says, great tutorial. I'm pretty. Oh, good. I'm glad you liked it. Donna says, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for watching. 
Teresa says, love the tutorial. Good, good. Cheryl says, I'd be watching tonight if you go live. Okay, so there's one person who will be watching. Um, Facebook user says, thanks for your time, Andrew. You're welcome. Thank you for your time. We know that there's a lot of different options out there, um, things you could be watching or people who you're spending time with or even doing anything else, you know. Um, so we appreciate it that you've made time to spend with us today. Susan says, thank you for doing this lovely tutorial. Well, I'm glad you like it. And um, Teresa says, love a work with me. Oh, good. All right. So maybe it'll be like a hybrid. I'll talk you through some of my ta thinking and well, maybe we'll, we'll call it something different. Well, I don't know. We'll see. All right. See ya. Thanks for watching, everybody.